My pot belly. Mena? Mina? Mena? Amazing four-course meal in front of me. Level one in the first Halo game on Xbox. Ooh, can I get a uh, Dunkin' Goa with the jelly filling? And... Well, let me just use my lowest voice. Gordon Ramsay kind of a personality that he's got. Try the Dunkin' Gola burger. Five sausages. Broadcasting live from inside the power band, this is The Blah. In this episode, everybody dies. I'm your host, the Wolverine, along with my faithful companions, Yar Higo. Greetings. And Algorithm. And salutations. And this week, we're going to be taking an interesting new dive. We're going to be exploring a book, and that would be the sci-fi classic first book of the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons. It's interesting talking about a book for a change. We were chatting before the show and we thought it would make sense to talk about this without any spoilers just because it's reasonable that people haven't read it yet. So um, we'll let you know when there are spoilers. But in the meantime, we'll talk about the story as a whole and hopefully convince you to read it if you haven't. Yes. Wikipedia had a, a pretty good synopsis. I'll give it a spin. It was nice and quick. Hopefully I don't sound like a jackass too. Well, I don't, hope it, hopefully I don't sound like more of a jackass than I normally do. Hey. Ooh, read it in the robot voice. I should try and read it in like a movie trailer voice. <laughs> All right. So in the 29th century, the hegemony of man comprises thousands of planets connected by farcaster portals. The hegemony man- maintains an uneasy alliance with the techno core, a civilization of AIs. Modified humans, known as ousters, live in space stations between stars and are engaged in conflict with the hegemony. Numerous outback planets have no farcasters and cannot be accessed without incurring significant time dilation. One of these planets is Hyperion home to structures known as the Time Tombs, which are moving backwards in time and guarded by a legendary creature known as the Shrike. On the eve of an ouster invasion of Hyperion, a final pilgrimage to the Time Tombs has been organized. The pilgrims decide that they will each tell their tale of how they were chosen for the pilgrimage. And that essentially is the first book. Boom. There you go. So yeah, I mean, just at a high level, this is a very, very interesting universe that was built in the late 80s, early 90s, and it's generally considered a classic of sci-fi, I believe. It is indeed, and it is a multiple award-winning book and series. And it's amazing to me, being published in 89, how well this still holds up. Mm, good point. Like, it it holds up beautifully, man. Like, I've listened to the audiobook, I've read the books numerous times, and it's still just fantastic. It still holds up perfectly. Definitely. Yeah, I think... Back in the day, uh, Benny, uh, probably the same for you, Kev, but Benny turned me on. You turned me on to this. Kev turned me on to it. Really? Boom. Yeah. I, I randomly found it. Yep. I like it. Twist ending. Many moons ago. Yes. But uh, yeah, I was you know back on the island doing a bit of work, and you recommended, um, I think I read Ilium and Olympus, another Dan Simmons uh, series first. Yes. Um, but then I ended up reading this one. So good. Yeah, Dan Simmons is a terrific writer, and uh, I've read mm. I've read the Hyperion series numerous times, and I've also read the those other two books that you talked about, Chad, many times, uh, Ilium and Olympus. So mm. he does really good sci-fi. Mm, I wish he would do more sci-fi. I think he's done a bunch of other like horror-y kind of stuff, but uh, his sci-fi is great. Yeah, yeah, he's a very prolific writer, actually, but uh, he's only done a little bit of sci-fi. Mm. Shame. It's it's this type of sci-fi, which, I mean, I suppose you could kind of call a space opera. I don't know. I, I'm so bad with those t- kind of terms, but I love just the gigantic universe building of certain types of sci-fi, and it's right up my alley. Totally. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, just it, it's one of the all-time, all-times. I haven't read a ton of science fiction, um, believe it or not, but this is something that I've gone back to usually at least once a year, and now that they have it in audiobook form, I've been listening to it more it's a little easier for me to get through so at any rate yeah excellent story excellent world building i wish he would do more sci-fi or even possibly more stories related to the hyperion cantos universe there's a rumbling that he's working on something else in hyperion uh the hyperion universe i think he posted on 
Facebook or something a few years ago, but said he didn't wasn't going to say what it was or what the timeline was. So who knows? Nice. The only other kind of high level thought I have, which isn't really a criticism so much as an observation, is like between this and and Ilium and Olympus, I find that he's very much like a kitchen sink kind of writer. Like I I remember specifically in in the other books, the Ilium and Olympus books, where it was just like, dude, are you like tying in everything you've ever learned ever? Because there's like ties to mm. like old poetry and old mythology and this tale and that tale. And it's just really quite funny how much he pulls into these tales. Yeah, it is. He, I did a little bit of reading about a few things surrounding this and he was a school teacher in a small town, small school in Missouri. And he started telling his students uh, one of his short stories in chunks. And then I believe it was, he was encouraged to publish it in a magazine and he did. And that's sort of how he kind of launched. But, you know, as a teacher, he's well-versed obviously in all of the, the great works by all of the great literary writers. And he incorporates that all extremely heavily into his stories. Mm, Definitely. So, folks, if you want the real backstory on this, go out and read all of the classics. Everything ever. The classic writers. <laughs> Ezra Pound, Keats, Yeats, Beats, all that. Beats by Dre. Yep, Beats by Dre. Uh, should we uh, dive into the first story? The structure, at least for me, of this one, where it's just a bunch of stories, kind of pissed me off for a while. It just kind of drags a bit, and I hadn't um, realized that uh, it's based on Canterbury Tales, which is a series of stories that kind of frame and tie a meta story together. So, I mean, the fact that it's based on history in terms of like an old writing structure, I appreciate now a little bit more. But I still find that uh, it's hard to treat the first book as just one book. Like it's it's basically two books and then another two books. Yeah. Which should kind of be seen as like two gigantic books, you know, like the first two books are one gigantic book and this and the Endymion books are a second gigantic book. So it's a bit of a challenge to get through and, and talk about, but we'll we'll give it our best shot. Yes. Maybe we should add that just for the folks at home that this story essentially takes place over a couple of days right before the events of the following book. Yeah. We should probably mention that we're about to get into spoiler territory here. Definitely. It's a six part six chapter book over the six stories of the six pilgrims pretty much it's epilogue six parts and then or prologue six parts then epilogue yeah ben you want to start on the priest tale okay so seven pilgrims are assembled on the tree ship Yggdrasil for the shrike pilgrimage they don't know anything about each other so one night at dinner they decide that each one of them should tell their story the first of which is the story of Father Lenar Hoyt. In telling his story, he puts forth that he has to tell the story of one Father Paul de Ray. By the way, Lenar Hoyt is a priest in the Catholic Church. Mm. Is it lame that I, I kind of wanted to chime in with a true story? Real world, when you were like seven pilgrims picked to live in a house. <laughs> 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 this is what happens when seven pilgrims get picked to live in a house together and things get real. If you don't shut up, I'm going to fucking kill you, Salinas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for, for Lenar Hoyt to tell his story, he has to tell the story of Father Paul Dure, who he accompanied to the planet of Hyperion and then leaves um, years later Paul Dure goes missing and they send Lenar Hoyt back to Hyperion to find him. And he, he doesn't find him, but he does find his journal, which tells his story. Do we want to go deeper into it than that? No, that's a good start. Um, he finds the journal who tells the story. And then it turns out that this Dure guy was searching for this group of people called the Baikura or, or whatever, however you pronounce it. And they end up being these this weird, sexless, idiocy group who... It shakes out are immortal because of a parasite stuck to their chests. 
So it's a very strange <laughs> intro to the book, but it sets you immediately into this crazy world with like flaming Tesla trees and all kinds of weird shit. So it's it's a really interesting uh, combination of like a failing religion a couple hundred years in the future that's now like a very small group of people known as the Catholic mm. Church combined with a really crazy planet. So it's a it's a interesting introduction. Yeah, uh, let me let me just back us up here a little bit. Um, I think it's important to note that Paul DeRay was not excommunicated, but he was exiled. And he decides to do missionary work as his sort of, I guess you could say, penance for his his exile, his sin. I can't remember exactly what he did, but... It's essentially an exile. Yeah, but so he chooses to go to Hyperion and uh, find the Bacura and sort of, you know, do missionary work, bring God to them. They were a sort of a lost tribe of what they think were human colonists from many hundreds of years before. And he decides to make the very arduous trek in to where they are on the Pinion Plateau to sort of bring the word of God to them. And that's where it really gets cooking. No pun intended. <laughs> hey. Hey. This, this particular story always kind of creeps me out. Same. Like there's, there's something creepy about the Bikura. And, you know, the way it, the way it unfolds where you don't really know what the fuck is going on. Um, and, you, you know, like you discover it basically day by day through these journal entries, like the things that unfold and the things that Duray learns about the Bikura. Mm. And, um, yeah, yeah. I just remember the first time reading it being like, uh, something bad's going to happen. Like you just, just there's like, you know, something bad's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, it's you're just a, right. Kind and of that's... a dread to the story that that you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a killer point because it, it the way that he writes the story, the reveal, you know, coming in the journal entries adds that that exact thing. And I, I didn't really think about that, but you're right because I remember that too, feeling that sort of sense of dread. It was, <laughs> you know, some bad gonna happen, <laughs> and it really ties in with his future horror kind of books like it definitely has that kind of suspensey horror kind of feel to it yeah yeah definitely i think that um you know also the way the journal fleshes out everything around him in the story i mean he uses the journal dan simmons i mean uses the journal stories as a great way to and the fact that deray has never been to hyperion he uses that to to really flesh out the world you know, that particular planet and its flora and fauna and the descriptions of the Bicura and their sort of habits and customs and all of that sort of stuff. So you really get a, a really good and detailed sense of that as you go through the story. I That's what I really enjoyed about it, you know, and, and, and just as an overarch with Dan Simmons in general, like the, the descriptions in the stories are so good and so vivid, you know, I, still have so many of those images in my head from when I, I sort of first, they first leapt off the page and into my brain. Mm. And it, it kind of, the, the journal format, to kind of close, the closing thought on the journal format for me is that it, it puts you as the reader in in the body of Hoyt reading these journal entries. And so you kind of are brought closer into the discovery because you're discovering, like you said, you're discovering at the same time he is and the horror is revealed to him at the same time it's revealed to you. And so it really puts you right there. Absolutely. You know, it starts with the lost tribe thing and then devolves into, it's actually not a lost tribe. It's actually like something totally different. And so it's kind of has that horror -y, I don't know if monstery thing is the right, mm. the right kind of analogy, but it's a, I hadn't really thought in depth about the format, but it's a, a great way to open the, open the book and start building the world because it just plops you straight into the seat. Well, yeah, in addition to that sort of feeling of dread that Ben mentioned, like you, I remember reading this for the first time and I, I was so blown away by where the story went. Like, you know, it just seemed all so academic in the beginning as he's trying to get to know these people, describing them. Yeah, naming them. You know, yeah, naming them Alpha, Beta, Delta, all of that sort of thing and, you know, figuring out, you know, the sexes and why they are the way that they are and the crude translating going on between, you know, the comlog essentially 
and them, you just like when it starts to turn, when he finally follows them down the cleft and finds the basilica, it's I, I was just like never thought in a million years it was gonna go there, which I, you know, always enjoy. Yeah, no question. Um there's a lot of great stuff, uh just I'll touch on, you know, like you said, uh, the unfolding of him figuring out that they are sexless and, you know, the whole time they're talking to him about, you know, being of the cruciform mm. and and Dure is sort of, uh, you know, it's like he thinks that there's some like lost uh, perhaps Christian civilization or whatever, I think, you know, like he, he's he's like trying to figure that out. He's like saying, like, I'm of the I'm of the cruciform, not really understanding what they're talking about. Um you know, and there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of tension that, that kind of goes on around that. Like there's a point I think where, you know, the, the Bakura kind of turn on him and, you know, you think he's going to get killed, but he doesn't. And, you know, like there's a lot of, uh, confusion going on, I think there, uh, in him trying to solve the mystery. And then, like you said, when he discovers the Basilica, it kind of all gets revealed. Mm. Yeah. And just a little bit of detail in there, it's, he comes into this lost civilization with a guide. The Bakura find them and kill the guide. And he's just like, what the fuck did you kill him for? And they said, oh, he wasn't of the cruciform. And the reason Duray wasn't killed is because he had a cross necklace. It wasn't until later when he's bathing for the first time that they see that he doesn't have an actual cruciform, which you come to find out is this crazy pink cross thing that's on the chests of all these Bakura. And, and I don't know if the Basilica bit that you mentioned, Kev, was before or after one of them dies, but maybe it was when they are going down there with the dead body or something, wasn't it? Yeah, he, one of them died first, and then when it the same person reappeared a few days later, then he became even more curious. Right. I, I really think that when they saw him bathing with the cross around his neck, they were confused. Yeah. So they they killed Tuck because he had no cross or cruciform whatsoever. And the, another interesting side note was that how the comlog translated cross, they would say, it always said, you are not of the cross slash cruciform. Right. You know, so it was, it, it sort of denotes their confusion as well. So I think that they saw the cross and they were confused thinking that it was a cruciform. It's in the same shape of a cruciform. And then I think later they sort of see that he's not of the cruciform, but they're still sort of ultimately confused by that, which is the single reason why he's allowed to live. And then ultimately, well, sort of not go into the basilica. He finds it himself. And then they later, they just sort of take him in there and hold him down. <laughs> yeah, the Shrike shows up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. They discover that he's not actually of the cruciform and sort of like, you know, uh, Dure is, keeps sort of insisting that he is of the cross and then like the Bakura decide like, okay, well, they're going to make him of the cruciform. Exactly. Against his will really towards the end. Yes. And I think at this point it's it's important to to note too, I mean, maybe for the audience, maybe not that the Bakura are essentially an entire tribe of people that are essentially the same effect as inbreeding. They're immortal. They're immortal because of the cruciform. But every time they're resurrected because of the cruciform, there's sort of less of them when they come back. Yeah, they're dumber or whatever. Yeah, it's described as being like an imperfect copy. Right. Exactly. It's a copy of a copy kind of thing. And like the old school mixtape thing, <laughs> a tape of a tape of a tape. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So after centuries of this going on, there's barely anything recognizable about them as individuals anymore. Not a, there's not a ton of <laughs> it's not a ton of gray matter left. Yeah. I mean, they're not even necessarily recognizable as human anymore, really, right? Well, they're essentially yeah, they're eunuchs, right? I mean, yeah, that was an interesting observation by by Dure where they don't need sexual reproduction anymore, so therefore they lose their sexual organs. Now that they're immortal, they just keep you know coming back to life and they no longer need to reproduce. And they're just sort of blissfully ignorant of so many things mm. because of said resurrectional inbreeding, you know. Yeah. But just really quickly for everybody out there, what happens in the story is that they, during one of their sleep periods, I believe it is, he climbs down this insane cleft 
via vines and finds the basilica. And at first he's really excited because he sees this sort of altar table and, you know, all of the cross shapes or cruciforms glowing on the walls. And he thinks he's found some, you know, incredible gift from God. And then later on, the Bakura drag him down there and they put one of the cruciforms on him. And as he gives himself med scans, he finds that the cruciform has invaded his body like in its totality almost. Mm, Like a crazy tree root kind of thing. Exactly. Like through all these fibrous strands and he can't get it off. It heals over his, his skin heals over it. And, you know, it just is is now part of him. Mm. So I guess, I guess the final kind of element to this is this first character, Dure, has got the cruciform. And when he leaves the grounds and tries to get away, it's very, like, horrifyingly painful for him. So he tries to leave and it doesn't quite work. And he has to go through this crazy forest full of trees that, like, have lightning and light on fire and stuff and, and ends up... Uh, Tr- trying to commit suicide, which for a Catholic is a pretty freaking big deal. And he ends up like climbing up one of these trees and kind of crucifies himself, so to speak, on one of these trees and just burns himself up to get rid of this cruciform. And if I remember correctly, that's kind of where it's left, or is it made clear that... Or maybe that's where the journals end and then Hoyt goes to find him and finds him on the tree or whatever. Well, yeah, okay, so it operates in the sense of like an invisible fence for a dog. And that you can only get so far away from, I don't know what, the Basilica, I'm probably assuming. The basilica, yeah, yeah, probably the Basilica, right, Ben? You know, and and then as soon as you start to get too far, it unleashes worlds of pain on you to get you to go back. And because it really could have gone either way. And he finds the thing to be an abomination. And that he essentially is an abomination. And so the whole idea of penetrating the Tesla, the flame forests, the Tesla trees, and then putting the journal in a Bestos pouch, because along with the flame trees and the Tesla trees, you also have the flame retarded bushes, (laughs) which is sort of funny, called the Bestos bushes. So he, he crafts that pouch out of the Bestos leaves. Just a fireproof thing, basically. Yeah, to make it totally fireproof. And and just just the the whole idea like of nailing himself up onto a tree and dying and being resurrected only to die again and be resurrected for literal years like i i can't even wrap my mind around that level of suffering and pain i mean like it's just insane yeah it's a pretty he- heavy duty climax to that particular tale i mean it wasn't just something he randomly did he had discovered at some point that like fire would destroy the or would break the connection with the right there was something like kind of specific about like doing that because he was you know he just wanted to get rid of the thing and he didn't care if it killed him right because to him being an abomination and the thing being an abomination was worse yeah yeah worse than going to hell it's not even about the tesla tree i mean he's a catholic so you commit suicide you go to hell so he'd rather go to hell for eternity than live for eternity as a bakura so it's it's quite a potent thing considering you know how cleverly woven the catholic church is into you know the 29th century totally man and and i think the um just correct me if i'm wrong is this is do we do we see the shrike for the first time in the basilica isn't that i believe that is the case yeah yeah I don't know if it's discussed much beyond that first encounter in terms of like the prologue and stuff, but that's definitely the first time you see it. Is in the Basilica on the cleft. The Shrike is very much like a observer kind of entity throughout the entirety of all of these stories. You know, like he didn't kill him or anything weird like that. You know, it was like he just kind of appeared. I suppose it's more of an it than a he, but yeah. Yeah, sorry. And they, yeah. It appeared and they held him down and put the cruciform on him. You know, he wasn't there to, you know, it was like he was just kind of there to make it, make sure that it happened. Mm. I suppose like. Which is a little cryptic. Yeah. What? It's just like a real mysterious thing. It sounds like you're going the same direction with cryptic. Like it's, the Shrike is a mysterious kind of demon in a way. And it's very uh, menacing throughout all of these stories. And we don't know. And the way he unfolds what the Shrike is during the course of the stories is great because Mm. it's slow enough that you're just dying to know more about it, you know, and then eventually 
you kind of get the full Monty there, you know. Hoyt's story is kind of interesting because it's like a test bed for like, you know, he, he sets up a mystery and you kind of figure out what's happening like fairly quickly, but also a bunch of other mysteries are are uh, you know, exposed to exist. And little little seeds, yeah. Yeah, some of them you find out about sooner, some of them you find out about later, and that's one of the great things about the series is I'll just kind of really jump outside here for a second and say like reading the first book Hyperion is always tough for me since I've read it the first time because it's just sort of there as an appetizer to like set you up for all this stuff that's going to unfold and you're you know by the end of the book you're like oh my god I want to know what happens you know um but once you've already read it it's kind of like all right. It's like the, you know, origin story or whatever fatigue, like for me anyway, yes. it's, it's usually, I mean, it's, it's awesome. Don't get me wrong. And if you haven't read it yet, you're going to love it. But for me, after reading it, you know, I, I couldn't even uh, many, many, many times. It's a bit of a slog to try and get through it. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that too, Benny. Cause like the more I was thinking about it recently and the more I was looking at stuff on like, you know, the Hyperion subreddit, it's almost always someone posting a post in the subreddit being like, I wish I could erase my brain and read this for the first time again. Yeah. And I I feel like that's exactly the case. And I I wish I could recall what my first reaction was because I've read it so many times now that I, I, I can't recall my first reactions, but I certainly would have loved... I would have loved it at the time. Like, a, it's kind of like a Fellowship of the Ring in the sense that it's like a big setup, but it's different in a lot of ways too. Yeah. For me, the first time reading it, Kev, I think you actually gave, you just like, like, here, take all four of the books. So I knew I had like, I knew I had a, a, you know, amazing four course meal in front of me. Mm. And uh, so it really just, it really set me up. Like it really teed me off to to get going on the rest of the story. And, and, you know, it raises so many uh, interesting questions and, and exposes, you know, like brings forth so many mysteries that um, it just it really whets your appetite to, to see what's going to happen in the story. Totally. Mm. And that's a p- potentially a good transition to like the story kind of climaxes, the first tale climaxes, and you kind of come to and you're sitting around the dining room table and the guy's telling the story to the group of pilgrims and you come to find out that he's in a lot of pain and you, and you come to find out that he has a cruciform and he also has a second cruciform and it's just like an interesting example of like a sprinkling of the mystery you know that it it's almost a completely told story but there's still a bunch left to learn about it oh so much so and i love the reveal at the end of the first story when you know they're talking about how he's describing how hoyt is and you know he's like basically white and sweating in pain he excuses himself to his cabin and then the console follows him you know cuz he knows something's up yeah and he makes him tell him the rest of the story, essentially. Revealing the two cruciforms, yeah. Exactly. Revealing that he has DeRay's cruciform and now his own cruciform. And so presumably when he dies, the other person will come to or they'll both come to in in some way, shape, or form. And it's just really intriguing. You don't quite know where it's going to go. Exactly right. And so in between the tales, there's, you know, pilgrimage kind of nuggets where it's like prologue pilgrimage comes together they're sitting around a dining room table on a giant space tree and Mm. priest tale happens then they're landing in the capital and the consul runs into a former buddy and they're kind of theo lane yeah theo lane and they end up bumping into this android dude who's going to take them where they need to go and it kind of gets the ball rolling and then at some point the second tale kicks off which is the soldier's tale which is fedman or Feyman kassad also known as uh, fred johnson aka captain ahab there you go i have the somewhat misfortune of having listened to this story on the audiobook so like i i was pronouncing a lot of the names of things incorrectly for quite a long time in my head at least I, it's incorrect according to the way the book um uh, pronounces them but i'm assuming that they got their cues from dan simmons himself you'd think so but yeah he in the in the audiobook version of this <laughs> it's always fedmon kasad like that's exactly how he says it every single time fedmon fedmon kasad it's sort of awkward to say yeah as a little cul-de-sac i find so often i just do not give a shit about character names or world names in books so i'm just like whatever my brain says out loud i'm just like yeah that's fine 
I get I get annoyed by like the flip flopping of you know what my brain decides in the moment. Yeah, mm. like <laughs> I have these weird like OCD things where like you know I'll read the name like Martin Salinas and then I'll be like, is it Silenus? Like, what did I think last time? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's super funny. Yeah, I remember. I remember the first read through. I just. I, I went back and forth. Mena, Mina, Mena, Mina. <laughs> the CEO. Yeah, you totally. know, I, cu- I couldn't decide what it was. Yeah, and I just kind of have given up. Like I'll just in these big books. Like Dune is another good one where you're just like, yeah, whatever. Tw- it's the slail issue. Sounds good. Whatever. I'm just gonna go with that. Yeah, I do that, but occasionally I get hung up rereading a word, and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> keep reading. <laughs> For sure. I mean, Dune is even worse. I think with the sort of you know, just just stick to those Duncan Golas, man. You know, they're on special this week. <laughs> hey, let's see if we can beat that one into the ground again. Ooh, can I get a uh, Duncan Gola with the uh, jelly filling and uh, powdered sugar? Uh, the lemon one, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I know, and I'll take and I'll take one of those super bizarre meatless sandwiches to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> they got uh these meatless sandwiches they've been pushing so hard for the last like six months. That's gross. I know, but here's the thing. I can't believe I didn't make this connection before. That is so Duncan Gola right there. Cause the Gola is essentially <laughs> the resurrected zombie of the original person in his, in essence. Right. Right. But so like they're, what they're using like beyond meat sausage or something. Yeah, it's Beyond Meat Sausage, exactly. So Yeah, Beyond Meat's not that good. No. And and one in a hundred of these burgers has like a cybernetic eye, and if you yell at it long enough, it wakes up <laughs> into its old self. <laughs> impossible burgers are pretty fucking good, though. <laughs> really? Yeah. What's an impossible burger? You know, it's another, uh, it's a more convincing variant of fake meat than oh, I got your you. average. Yes, veggie burger kind of a thing like they use like it's a bloody vegetable yeah yeah exactly they use heme which is like you know what the the compound that makes beef taste like beef you know it's like the blood taste the irony taste so they use that and other stuff and it it even looks like ground beef you know <laughs> when you when it's raw it's weird it's weird but it's good i mean you know i, I want them to actually produce the shit in the lab at some point I have no, I have no problems with that at all. It's better for really? the environment and it's better for the suffering of creatures. Yeah, I'm with, it. I'm kind of with you on that one. Yeah. So, however they come about it, whether it's some artificial, you know, soy based thing, I'm not really crazy about eating a lot of soy, but nor I. You know, if they do, I don't know how the fuck we got on this one. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a moment of levity between heavy duty tales. Yeah, I'm taking a soapbox moment to, uh, to tell people that if if your if your thought is ugh <laughs> when you think of these things you should rethink it because it's definitely something that could potentially be very good for the environment and very good for you know our own sanity knowing that we're not creating any suffering absolutely man so there you go folks next time you're dunkin donuts <laughs> try the dunkin gola burger <laughs> endorsed by jarhigo himself just don't yell at it too much <laughs> Delicious Tleilaxu burger made in a, uh, <laughs> formed in the, uh, what, what the hell are a sh- they? A the Schlottel tanks. Axlottle tank, yeah. <laughs> God, all those words are so gross sounding. Okay, let's move on to the soldier's story. Fedman Kassad is a force colonel who, from the time of his early sort of training or time in the military, as they would go through these um, virtual reality simulations, he started being visited by this woman who would sort of help him in, in these battles, these simulated battles, and then they became lovers. So this happened multiple times in his lifetime. He would go through these sims, and each time he would be visited by this woman whose name is Moneta, we find out later. And... It sort of culminates in there's a major battle. He gets badly injured. And as he is on a hospital ship on his way back into the web, the ship gets attacked by the ousters. And he subsequently ends up on the planet where he is visited by this woman 
uh, again. Outside of VR. Yeah, and they join in the fighting with the ousters, and then ultimately they fight with, and then he sort of fights against the Shrike. And then as they're making love on the battlefield, which happens in almost every encounter, um, the woman becomes the Shrike at one point in their lovemaking. And he his purpose in returning to Hyperion is to battle the Shrike, basically, and kill the Shrike and the woman. I think that um, this story, at this point, too, for me, the first half of it becomes a slog. So, honestly, I really glassed over, like, most of the encounters. I mean, and the thing, there's a, a couple of things that really jump out at me in, in this story. And I, I gloss over the beginning encounters because, I don't know, they, they just sort of get repetitive, kind of like the, um, the scholar's tale which we'll touch on later in terms of like, you know, it, it gets to be, it's like, okay, he could, does a sim and then he, she meets him in battle. They kill a bunch of people. It's super bloody. And then they have sex. It's, you know, it's a little morbid sort of in that sense. Yeah. The character of Moneta, of course, is very interesting because, you know, it's this strange woman just appearing in these simulations. That part I found cool. I found the part where he was injured on the hospital ship and the subsequent destruction of the ship and him escaping to the planet, which, of course, is Hyperion, uh, to be incredibly cool. It's so descriptive, man, from the second he wakes up and talks to the nurse until he gets down to the planet. I, I just was gripped listening to it the other day. It, it, it's so damn good. Every single little detail, just about the ship breaking up, about you know finding the dead Marine, getting him out of the suit, getting him in the suit, the ousters coming on the ship, how he dispatches them, and then you know stealing one of their suits, then stealing one of their ships. Like it's just super descriptive, so you can really you know really get a sense of what's going on. You are so thoroughly immersed in that. Um, particular part of the story. And and that is really the locus of this story, I think, is that particular encounter. And I'm really glad that he chose to put in the whole part with the hospital ship and the final encounter with Moneta and the Shrike. The Ouster ship thing, like, I don't recall it very clearly. It's been a couple months since I read the first book. I just read all four of the books. And so for whatever reason, I overloaded my brain and I can't remember any of the first book anymore. But when you were retelling that a second ago, all I kept thinking about was level one in the first Halo game on Xbox. <laughs> so it kind of has that <laughs> kind of has that flavor to it. <laughs> but I also like it also jumped out at me that uh Nice. It's a really clever way to get the reader back onto a traditional sci fi train because you're going from this crazy flame tree Christian parasite immortal you know, idiocracy kind of thing where it's really fascinating, but it's just like, okay, here's a space battle you know, space marine story to kind of get you back into what you're used to in sci-fi. So it's kind of interesting that it's structured in that way because it, it brings you back to something semi-familiar and gives you an action sequence to kind of, you know, whet the appetite. Mm, it does. And I think that um the, the flashbacking, well, we're sort of when he does the simulations, a lot of the battles are famous battles from the past. So he's fighting, you know, knights or Civil War soldiers, and he is using, you know, weapons of the period, armor of the period, that sort of thing, which I... I think it was very it was very cool, but I think that's also part of the reason why I, I sort of just glossed past it the, this time. Yeah, but again, on the first reading, it'd be pretty awesome. Oh, in the first read, it's really great. The first couple reads, it's really great, and then I'm sure I'll, I will I will misremember it, and then I'll read it again, you know, in an, in an upcoming session of reading these books. But um, I really think that the the hospital ship part and the escape is really the the locus, the final encounter with Moneta. So. The other things that I liked from this particular story was just, again, like you said, it's a sci-fi soldier space battle story. And we also get a lot of world building for the first time. Like in the beginning of the story, we get some world building with the, the Yggdrasil, the tree ship, which we didn't even really mention that much. But we also get more of a scope in this story of how big the the hegemony is, how big the world web is, and these various different planets in the web. So I really dug that. We also get a ton of lore and description about force, the military unit 
in this world that Dan Simmons has built. And we, we get a lot of detail about the weapons, the suits they use, the tactics, the techniques, the technology, like it's super, super descriptive and still again, holds up super well compared to a lot of other sci-fi that we get. That's, you know, even contemporary in terms of like the technology and the world building and all that sort of thing. So th- those are the things that I really liked about this story. I don't really recall how much of it has gotten into now, but one of the interesting things that I saw someone writing about was how, you know, the word force for this military group is all caps. And it was interesting in the sense that like one of the key functions of the force military is to, is to literally force outback planets into uh, becoming colonies. And so it very much has that like old school colonial, whether you like it or not, you're going to be a colony and we're going to, you know, take your resources and put tourists all over the place and, and fuck your planet up real good, which we'll get to a little bit later with the consul's tale. But I, I thought it was a not so subtle nod to the fact that they literally just go around forcing people to do stuff. So it was just an interesting little nugget. I never even made that connection, man. I uh, It's brilliant. I, I never thought of it like that, ever. Yeah, same, same. I just saw someone on maybe on Reddit talking about it. I thought it was clever. Yeah, I was wondering if the capitalization was some kind of an uh, acronym, but I don't think that it was ever revealed. So that's a, an interesting reason for it, I guess I would say. Yeah. It's always like... Um, well, all the all the various like arms of force. It's like force space, force sea, and force ground. Right. We're gonna force you to do shit in space. <laughs> we're gonna force <laughs> you to do shit on the ground, and we're gonna force you to do shit in the sea. That's it. Yeah. Uh, isn't there a, at some point? I don't know if they like go into the future to fight the ousters, or whether it's like a present day thing. But either way, like Manetta gives him this crazy silver kind of mercury suit of skin suit thing that was quite cool that's like after he finds around hyperion yeah he's pretty beat up from the crash and she finds him gives him the skin suit which essentially does three things it can shift him through time heal heal his wounds and uh it, it's also armor like an, an adaptive sort of armor in a kind of t1000 sort of way yeah, and the fact that it just looks like a, a slick mirror coating over your skin. So you would look like yes. you would essentially look like the that, you know, liquid metal terminator before it takes on any form. Yeah, mm. totally. It's sort of an indescript human shape. Yeah, I really enjoyed the time shifting aspect of that. Like how, you know, Fedmon Kassad is like described like, you know, the the ousters are essentially moving in slow motion from his perspective. So he's just able to move around super fast and he's not using a gun or anything. He's just like killing people with his hands, right? Like <laughs> it's insane. That he can make bladed weapons with the skin suit, you know? Yeah. That's why I made the T one thousand reference. But yeah, you're right, you're right, Ben. Yeah, all right, yeah, that's true. I really liked because he can get the time so slow, you know, and again, this is Dan Simmons, like incredible descriptive writing, like just like how the particles of sand are like hanging in the air and like, you know, all the different things that he can see and feel in fast time, you know, is just super, super cool. And that, yeah, does that, that kind of climaxes with the battle of the skin suits ends and that's when they start hooking up again and she turns into the Shrike. Is that that sequence? Yes, Chad. And climax is an apt word. Hey, ho. Yeah. Because that is what happens. And that was the, my final thing about this story. I can't, I can't I'm cringing just thinking about it right now because <laughs> they end up having sex and then she turns into the Shrike and the Shrike just as a quick little recap for anybody out there is a basically giant nine foot tall metal monster with metal thorns, spikes and barbed wire all over his body. So he's having sex with this creature and there's blood and it's just, it is the sort of the epitome of making sex into an abomination. And again, I cringe every single time I read it and think about it. But it's it's not just that, um, you know, talk about some pretty vivid description. Um, yeah. You know, Kassad, as he's, as he's going around in fast time and killing all these ousters, is developing this like 
bloodlust. Like the more he kills, the more he wants to kill. And it's described at one point that he looks down and he like has like a fucking raging boner. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. And that's like when, and you know, it's like, there's like carnage all around and he and Monita like start making love, like right in the midst of all this stuff. And that's, yeah, exactly. Ugh. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, the. <laughs> But it makes sense in a way, like that, like pure bloodlust. You know, it's taking it to the nth degree. But from from a literary perspective, like why not explore it? You know, I think that one of my only frustrations with this particular story is is how his sort of desire and reason to go on the pilgrimage is so base. It's like I just want to kill the Shrike and Moneta. Like I would think after all that and all those events, I would be more curious than anything. But maybe not. I, I could be wrong. That's just me. Yeah, I kind of, I, I hear you, but I kind of got the vibe that, like, that's what he says he wants to do, but what he actually wants to do is go and find them again. It's almost like her as a touchstone in his life is, like, mo- the most important thing, and she just disappears all the time. So I kind of get the vibe that he's only on board, really, for selfish reasons of wanting to run into them again, to kill him, to kill to kill the Shrike and to uh, to run into her again and potentially kill her. But I reckon that she, he doesn't even... He, he'd prefer not to kill her, you know what I mean? Like, he wants to ride off into the sunset, but he's probably fucking dreaming. That was kind of the, the, the how I was thinking about it at the time. Yeah, no, no. I think you're probably right about that. I mean, well, you're talking about somebody that he's, you know, like, when you really fall in love with somebody and you you feel that connected to somebody, it's like if you've been anyway that's ever been betrayed it's like it, it feels like you're just having your soul torn out so uh, that's that's really intense to go through and then for that same person to become this horrible creature in the middle of lovemaking is like traumatic it is <laughs> a literal abomination yeah super traumatic so i guess we're we probably sh- i should probably just be happy that the guy's not curled up in a ball on the floor of some psychiatric medical ship or something <laughs> yeah Instead, he's got some giant assault rifle, and he's going to go, uh, you know, predator style in and, and kill the Shrike. Totally. Uh, all right, so let's move on to the poet's tale. Yeah, the um, the note I have for the random in between nugget is that there's nothing of note. They just like find some burnt out town, and then Selenius tells his story. They find some burned out town. Oh, right. Yes, of course. The Poet's Tale is another interesting one in the sense that, like, you go from the crazy Christian story to the traditional space marine story, and now it's kind of a really interesting bit of world building with a with a, a writer writing a story within a story. <laughs> yeah, and some comedy there as well. Should we yeah. do a turbo? Should I do a turbo synopsis of this? Yeah, one? go for it, man. Okay, so the poet Martin Selenus was born on old Earth, we find out, because in this world, Earth does not exist. Due to an accident and through a couple of long cryogenic sleeps and some pulsing treatments, uh, which are basically used to extend the lifespan of people, he has been around for hundreds of years already, okay? So he writes... He starts writing the Hyperion Cantos. Somebody gives it to a publisher. They take out all the good parts and leave in all the shitty parts, and it sells bazillions of copies, and he becomes a multi-gazillionaire. And then eventually gives up on that because he's tired of just writing schlocky crap. And he gets asked by sad King Billy of the planet Asquith to join his artist's colony, and they are going to move it and sort of recreate it anew on the world of Hyperion. So he goes with Billy to Hyperion, and as he's writing the Cantos again and exp- and expanding on it, the Shrike appears and starts to kill people, and it just starts basically dwindling down the population of the Poet City, which is where they live. And he has somewhat of a showdown with Billy and the Shrike at the end, where Billy is trying to burn the Cantos and essentially the Shrike won't let him because the Cantos is, in my opinion anyway, three things. It's a chronicle of what's happening. It's a chronicle of what has happened. And it's also sort of telling the future as he's writing it. It's interesting. Mm. That's it. So you guys can go first on this one. What were some of the things you liked about this story? There was a uh, there was a little interlude in kind of the middle of what you were just saying 
between him being a gazillionaire and him going to Hyperion where he's in, maybe it's even earlier, but he's in cryofugue and gets woken up. His mom puts him in cryofugue after Earth, um, hoping that all of the debts will be cleared because the money that's put in the account will accrue so much interest that he'll come out really rich and he comes out like brain damaged and poor and he's like a fucking slave miner in some podunk place and he can only say like fuck shit and cunt or something like that yeah. and it's just like <laughs> the funniest <laughs> seven swear words it's like so funny <laughs> seven yeah seven words because he had like a he had what's tantamount to a stroke in cryo sleep so he can only use seven words and they're all they're all like expletives yes yeah, it's, it's, i just gotta yeah i really enjoyed that bit of uh levity yeah, it was pretty funny. It's like you're led to believe that he's able to, like, people that know him well enough are able to understand what he's saying with those seven <laughs> words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really but funny. But he goes from only having seven words to, like, eventually learning more and more and more and, like, teaching himself how to be a writer again. And it was just, yeah, it was, it was a great little thing. It definitely lends a great layer to the character and, and explains so much of his, like, gruff, you know, Gordon Ramsay kind of uh, personality that he's got. Mm, that's a good way to describe him. Good comparison. Yeah, definitely good comparison. No, now, whenever I read this, I'm going to think of Gordon. <laughs> going to see him there. <laughs> totally. <laughs> right. Uh, you donkey. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things I like about this story. I love just sort of the general levity. He has a way of looking in the. He has a cynicism that is. It's not just the cynicism, but he's able to see the levity in so many things and not so much in a cynical sense, but almost in the sense of like, you know, treat the things of most importance with the least amount of seriousness and treat things of least importance with the most amount of seriousness. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. So it's sort of beyond cynicism, which is not unlike myself. And I really like that a lot. There's so much levity in this story and a, a lot of really funny things. It just made me straight up laugh when I was reading it. And there's also, again, like Kassad's story, but uh, just from a different angle, you just get so much lore and so much world building. So this is where we first get to, we finally start to understand like what happened to old earth originally and what it was like before everybody left, you know, and just the whole idea of North America being a preserve and herds of dinosaurs roaming around and, you know, how he just lived on this massive estate with perfect lawns that were like, you know, the size of entire states, you know, like just super, super cool. And, and again, you know, I'm going to keep saying this cause it's, exactly true is Dan Simmons descriptiveness is incredible. Like the whole description of heaven's gate and even, even how he utilized those seven different expletives to communicate. Like there's a whole section on that. That's it's brilliant, man. It really, really is. And just the descriptiveness of heaven's gate and everything that happens during the course of his story is, is fantastic, man. Uh, the other thing that I just loved from read one, and I still love hearing about it is the bloody farcaster home. It's the coolest thing ever, man. You know, uh, rooms on different worlds, all connected by farcaster doors, just super, super cool. Which, you know, it's unlikely anyone listening to this hasn't read the books, but they're just basically portals to other worlds like wormholes, and one of my favorite examples was the uh, the bathroom where you open the door to the bathroom and it's like a shitter on a raft in the middle of an ocean planet. <laughs> it's just like totally. I would totally have like one of those if I was a, a bazillionaire. That's <laughs> so good. Yeah, the Farcaster house is super cool. That's something that always left an impression on me. And it's it's actually like I don't know if we get a whole lot of description of what it is actually like to step through a Farcaster until you get to that part. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's definitely a cool way to, to like really flesh the, the concept of the Farcaster out. The other thing I guess I would add about that is there's definitely a Rick and Morty episode that recently happened that I'm sure they must have bit from this because, uh, you know, as it turns out, uh, Rick is like a private pooper. <laughs> so he has 
he has like a secret, you know, like a world that he built just for himself with like a, a toilet and like, you know, it has like a view of it's like on a river and there's like a view of a mountain. Like he can just go there and he's completely by himself. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. Again, with the Rick and Morty reference, dude. Nice. It's perfect, though. Yeah, it's just just uh, it's just appropriate. But um, yeah, I mean, just the idea that uh, Martin Salinas is, uh, you know, that he's been around for as long as he has. And he's seen so much and like, you know, it's like nobody in the nobody in the pilgrimage party believes that he actually was born on old earth, you know, or he, or he even appreciates that he's been around that long and has so much knowledge about the world because he's such a salty dog. But he's a yeah, he's a shithead. So <laughs> nobody likes him. <laughs> but when you when you said that a minute ago, Kev, it totally made me think of like, you know, it reminded me of my dad, for example, where like. It seems like when people get older, they just don't give a shit anymore. And they're like, I'll get into the hot tub naked. I don't fucking care. You know, and it's just like, ah, oh, nobody wants to see that. Yeah. But like the older you get, the less you give a shit what anyone else thinks. And this dude's like 600 years old. So he just doesn't give a shit. And I just think it's really funny. Oh, there are no fucks being given here for sure, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, it's clear that he sort of sees, uh, you know, some of these other people with like a bit of contempt, you know, mm. because like, because he's been around for so long and he's seen so much, like, you know, it's like they, the other people seem to think they have things figured out and he probably knows better, you know? Absolutely, man. And he ends up uh, having quite an adversarial relationship with, uh, the brick shit house Bron Lamia, which, uh, you know, we'll get to a little bit later, but I, I love that. There's a bit of tension in the in the group. Well, that's he starts off the story by saying, "I was born on Earth, old Earth." And fuck you, Lamia, if you don't believe me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, they're totally antagonistic towards each other. The um, just like a couple of tiny little comments on stuff that you spoke about a little bit earlier was um, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the um, the fact that he hated the book that got him really rich. Like <laughs> he was like, it kind of had that like Harry Potter kind of thing going on, where like you write a book for you know the lowest common denominator. Like for J.K. Rowling, she wrote the book for like elementary school children, so it was intentional. But it's not exactly Shakespeare, you know. And she's a freaking billionaire now as a result, and it seems very similar where. You know, he was trying to write this like super deep poetry and prose, and then they just like gutted it and turned it into a kind of a shitty book, and he just becomes like a pop star. I just really enjoyed that, and he's like in his Farcaster house, and you know, it really, like he said, does a great job of explaining the Farcasters be have, by having every room on a different planet. But he's just so grumpy about it the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, you definitely get the impression that he would rather uh, be less successful but be known as being, like, a serious writer. Yeah, yeah. There's probably a bit of meta in there from uh, from Dan Simmons, but uh, it's uh, it's very, very funny. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, the, the amount of, like, <laughs> the amount of serious, serious, you know, uh, authors that, that Simmons references in his in his stories, like, you know... It's almost like he's like trying to, he's like, oh, all right, I know you're reading this because you like sci-fi, but maybe you might want to check out uh, Shakespeare or maybe you might want to check out the poetry of Keats or whatever. You know, it's like he's like kind of like throwing this little thing in there, this little jab in there at you to like <laughs> entice you to like read a little deeper. Check it out. I have to say I was tempted in finding out this was based on the Canterbury Tales. I was like, I really should go and read that. And I like saw some of the verses in Wikipedia and I was like, fuck, that looks like really a slog to read. I don't think I can do that. (laughs) (laughs) Like I want to read the classics, but I just, I just, I'd have never been able to bring myself to read a lot of them. You know, when you're going to read them later when you're old, when I've got like a 40, 40 year old bottle of scotch and a a smoking jacket with a bubble pipe. There you go. Mm. A bubble pipe. Perfect. Just like Bart. Exactly. Um, whether or not we dive into this, uh, you mentioned before, Kev, um, the Cantus having kind of three elements to it. And one of the things I thought was quite fascinating was how he, Martin Salinas, Salinas or whatever the fuck it is. Salinas? Oh, my God. You know how they say it in the audiobook? How? Oh. Silenus. Oh, fuck that. Oh, it's so annoying. Um, 
but how Martin Silenus has the Shrike as his muse. So he's convinced that being close to the Shrike allows him to, you know, find the uh, the Cantos in the ether, so to totally. speak. Totally. So I, I thought that was super fascinating. And that, if I remember correctly, was kind of the big issue with Sad King Billy is, you know, Sad King Billy is like the reason that the Shrike is killing everyone is because you're creating the environment for him to kill by writing about him. And it's like King Billy's convinced that it's connected or whatever. So whether it is or not. Who knows? But it was a super interesting part of the story. Well, no, it clearly is, and that's that. That was what I was saying. Was that the canto serves three purposes? It's it's telling, it's like telling what's happening in real time. It's also telling what's going to happen. It's also a chronicle of what has happened. Like it's yeah, it's super cool and it's a super meta, you know, sort of thing that's going on inside this this in, story in its entirety. You know, and does it specifically? say that the book you're reading, like the book that we all actually read, was the Cantus as written by Salinas, because I know that it's a little bit more clear in the in the second uh you know, two books or whatever, but not to my recollection. I don't no. think it's really specifically sketched out in the first two books. No, I don't think so. Yeah. But I do feel as though it's pretty solid that that's kind of what's implied. Yeah, but you're he's also writing the Cantos in verse and the story is in, you know, Long form, so that's true. At any rate, um, any other thoughts on this particular story, or should we uh, move it right along? Yeah, it's going to tack on that his motivation for going on the on the pilgrimages so that he can get back into proximity with the, the Shrike and finish finish the Cantos, despite the fact that he's just as scared shitless by the Shrike as everybody else is. Totally, like he's willing he's willing to like you know get killed just to see it through, kind of a thing. Yeah, it's, he's got that burning desire to finish his work, which I suppose really ties ties everything up in a bow in researching this with uh, the Canterbury Tales being unfinished, and you know the death of the author before he could finish them, and the fact that there's no original manuscript of the Canterbury Tales. There's only other people's translations, so it really kind of is a meta Martin Selenius where you know he wrote the cantos in verse but it's not what we're what we're reading and that he's afraid of dying before he finishes it so it's kind of the closest direct connection to that canterbury's tale thing that i was reading so that's kind of interesting mm-hmm. very interesting the only other thing i would add is uh in between the poet's tale and the scholar's tale is the first time we encounter the wind wagon and the sea of grass which i thought was really awesome oh my god yes so the the pilgrims are traveling to the time tombs and in between each of these stories you get a little nugget of what they're up to um, and in this particular case, they're on this crazy kind of sailboat with wheels that goes through this billion acre grass thing that you can't walk through because there's like giant fucking worms or something. But super interesting, descriptive world building, as you mentioned in many other examples. No, there's the grass serpents. That's it. That's what it is. And I'm totally picturing the stop motion Beetlejuice, you know, white, black and white striped snaky things. Oh, my God. Yes, Totally. I love that whole – all of the interlude parts where you, you get a little bit more about the world and, and all of that stuff is just super cool. And the wind wagon part was just one of my favorite things, period. Mm. Yeah, the the idea of a grass sea is pretty fucking cool. So cool. And, uh, you know, a wind wagon is – you know, it's like something that would only exist on Hyperion because of – because of the fact that there's a grass sea, because of the fact that there are these powerful winds, you know, like it, it all, like it's something you would only find there. And it's definitely a very cool, uh, you know, Simmons comes up with some really neat ideas, uh, concepts, and also some neat tech. And the, the wind wagon fits dovetails in there very nicely. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But yeah, the uh, Scholar's Tale is next. And you mentioned you kind of blasted through it, Kev. I, my vote is... Let's just give a synopsis of the tale and move on because it's yeah. not. I want to talk about it a little bit. You don't really like it, huh? All right. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, there's a few things we can touch on for sure. So the scholar's tale is about Saul Weintraub, who has a daughter named Rachel. And in the beginning of the story, we start out and Rachel is like a 20 something. She goes to university, becomes an archaeologist. I'm pretty sure it's an archaeologist. And then she ends up choosing to go with, I think it's one of her professors. His name is um, Emilio Arundes. 
to study the time tombs on Hyperion. And during the course of their research in the tombs themselves, something happens and she starts feeling strange and she eventually goes back to Hebron, which is the, you know, a lot of the worlds in the Hyperion universe are kind of analogs to things we have here, obviously, in our world. And Hebron is like the the Jewish planet, essentially. And she goes back to Hebron and it, it turns out that she's basically aging backwards. She has what what is later dubbed Merlin sickness. sickness. So she's aging backwards um, down to an infant. And in the story, he describes basically her growing up and then going to the time tombs and then catching the Merlin sickness and then him and his wife, now much, much older, having to, you know, care for your own child, which is aging backwards. And his purpose in the pilgrimage is to make a request of the Shrike to, you know, heal his daughter. And the only other thing that's large in this noteworthy story bit is that he keeps having these dreams that turns out that his wife is also having where he's talking to what he thinks is God. Um, and the voice keeps saying, Saul, you must go to the planet Hyperion and give your daughter as a burnt offering. And he wrestles with that during the course of, you know, the tale and all of that sort of thing. So that's, that's the basic. Mm. And you didn't really dig that story, or you just find on the multiple reads it's one that you skip over? Uh, column B. I love the story. I think it's fantastic. It, it's super cool. The idea of, you know, just somebody aging in reverse, you know, kind of like Benjamin Button, I guess, like is it, it's definitely a cool concept. And, you know, now as a parent, especially like having to watch your kid grow up and then like the pain of watching them devolve down to a baby again and not know what the hell is going to happen when they get to zero is horrifying, really. Um, I, I just stopped reading it because I know it. It's, you know, you know, it's not super interesting beyond the first couple reads. You know, I, I skipped it this time. I, I've listened to it and watched it. I read it rather many times. So, the, the dilemma with the voice is cool. I like the reveal that his wife is also seeing the – or having the dreams and seeing the altar and the vo- and hearing the voice as well. But that's why I didn't read it this time. Yeah. Um, there's something about uh, things going in, in a reverse order here and, you know, the natural order of things where, like, you know, your parents get older and, you know, you get older and, you know, you're, you're – you know, parents don't typically have to watch their kids die or, you know, they shouldn't have to watch their kids die if things go well. And the fact that like Saul is pretty old and he's had to sort of like raise his daughter and then reverse raise his daughter. Like there's just something really interesting about, about all of that situation, you know, and, and the emotional impact that it had on him and on uh, Saul and his, his wife, Sarai. And um, yeah, I just, there's like, kind of a heartfelt uh, thing going on with this story, which isn't something that you're getting with a, a lot of the rest of the stories. So I enjoyed that part of it. You know, it kind of, you kind of feel sad for, for Saul and that part of the story I liked. And it's, it's something a little bit different from the rest of the pilgrim stories. Yeah. You end up with a ton of sympathy for him. And also, especially after his wife passes away and he's alone having to do this, you know, yeah. it's like, that's a lot, man. And the the fact that they have the, you know, the wife isn't super present in the story. It's really focused on on Saul's perspective. But I like that it's, you know, a similar burden for both he and his wife. And in this particular story, his wife, you know, clearly has difficulties with the burden, especially as like, you know, let's just say she's 26 years old. Like she goes through 20 years of reverse aging. And when the kid's six or five or four and like starting to, you know, maybe even earlier, like three or two, and they, they're, she's losing her language. The mother just can't handle it anymore. And she's like, I'm out of here. I got to I got to take a break and go visit my family. And she just dies in a car crash. And it's just like so tragic man yeah it is you're right this is a very very tragic story you have so much sympathy for Saul and his wife and like you know the 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 really interesting nuance to it is is that each day Rachel forgets you know so like 
there's an interesting moment where like she goes uh, off to Hyperion with her mentor and ends up, you know, hooking up with the mentor and they're falling in love and like it's going to be a, th- you know, a relationship or it is a, a strong relationship and then she gets sick and it gets to the point where like every day they need to tell her what's happening. She's aging in reverse and then eventually like the day that she's aging back is before she met the 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 lover and so now she no longer knows who the lover is and he's heartbroken. Mm. It's just so much tragedy in it. It's a really powerful story. Yeah, there's like a an analog there for something like people who de- who've had to deal with you know uh, loved ones with like Alzheimer's or something along those lines. Um, no doubt. Yeah. In terms of this particular story, one of the things I really enjoyed about it, or one of the more interesting elements, is the like is Saul's dilemma in terms of the vision and how he's a scholar. I believe he's a religious scholar throughout, but regardless, he becomes a religious scholar, if not, and studies the sacrifice of Abraham and and really tries to push the theological study of, like, you know, why does Abraham do what he does, and does he make the decision knowing that his kid is going to be sacrificed or not, and and, and really just dives so deeply into the theology to try and determine what he should do with his own daughter. And I really enjoyed that kind of connection to that, that mythology. Yeah. It's like a philosophical and a spiritual debate that he's having with himself sort of the entire time, you know? And those are, those are, those are like the weightiest and the, the hardest things to sort of wrestle with in your head. I I think for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's a perfect example of kind of the way Simmons, ties in existing cultural mythologies into his stories. Totally. I think that um, the cool part of this at the end is where we find out that Hepmestein goes missing on the wind wagon and his cabin is full of blood um, because it just makes an already mysterious character even more mysterious because we don't get to hear his tale. Yep. Because he was the next – well, he's not the next, but – he so all everything was everything that was left in his room and he was missing and there was blood everywhere and it's just crazy i i was just dying to know even still what happened to him and we still never really find out yeah not in the first book the um the 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 other interesting bit in that at that same time in the interlude is uh the Yggdrasil tree ship is destroyed so like we didn't spend a lot of time on on the tree ship in the beginning, but it's a super interesting, hyper descriptive, gigantic tree ship that this entire religious group called the Templars cart around as like whatever. They go to Flossen's Paradise with these giant ships or something, but it ends up being destroyed and Mastine is like really heartbroken about it and kind of goes into his cabin and then they all go to sleep and then the next morning is when all of the uh, the blood's everywhere and stuff. So it's a really significant moment in the interlude, but they don't really give anything away as to what happens until a hell of a lot later. And we don't really get a lot more about a lot of what we just said, you know, in terms of like his almost telepathic connection with his tree ship and, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, it definitely has the like who done it kind of thing there with the the bloody room. A bit of a clue, Colonel Mustard in the ballroom with the candlestick kind of. You're like, what the fuck is happening here? And then it just they just don't go back to it for a long time. Totally. All right. It's kind of an interesting way for the book to segue into the detective's tale. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, that's interesting because you can't have a can't have any story without a good noir detective chunk, right? You certainly can't have a story that uh, Kev Muller likes without a good detective noir chunk. <laughs> you said it, man. <laughs> All right, moving right along to part five, the detective's tale, or the detective's story, the long goodbye. This story involves Braun Lamia, whose father was a senator that worked closely with uh, Mina Gladstone who is the current CEO of the hegemony. And she gets approached in her office by a strange and interesting guy because she's a detective. He wants her to find out who killed him. And she doesn't really understand until he reveals that he's a cybrid. So he's sort of half technocore AI and half human. His consciousness sort of exists in the core. And when he says murdered, he means that there was a like a millisecond interruption in his sort of connection to the core. And he also lost some memory. 
so the story ends up being her kind of unraveling this thread of who killed him, why they wanted him killed, and then ultimately go on the pilgrimage to Hyperion. But at this point, Johnny, who is the cybrid, has been killed and his consciousness has been uploaded into what's called a Shron loop, which is implanted in the back of Braun's skull. A la Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah, a la Johnny Mnemonic, totally. So that's about as short as I can make that one. Yeah, that's pretty There's good. There's a lot, lot going on in this story. It's a great detective story, a great action story that's not like soldiers in space battles. But, you know, again, we get a lot of interesting details about the world of the hege- hegemony, farcasters, cybrids, all of that stuff. It's, it's a really, really great story. Definitely. Yeah, the one one of the interesting world building elements that I really enjoyed on this one was Braun Lamia's home planet was like a 1.6 or 1.7 G planet. So she, she and everyone on her planet are built like brick shit houses. And uh, I enjoyed that just sprinkling of interesting lore in there. And it, it kind of comes into play later with a bit of a chase sequence. Totally. But you also mentioned the cybrid johnny and his connection with the techno core and i think it's one of the early ish introductions of the techno core if not the introduction i believe it is the introduction yeah yeah and i really loved the idea of it and like it's not super thoroughly explained but it's just essentially like a group of ai that eventually achieve a civilization of their own basically and separate themselves from humanity and it's just interesting it's not the first well i mean this was written in 89 so maybe it is one of the first times it was it was done but i think a lot of people would be quite familiar with it from maybe like the animatrix stuff with the way things panned out in that universe but i really like the idea of different factions in the techno core which is kind of the climax of the story is explaining the the motivations of the group of AIs and why they're fucking around with things. And it's a, it's a really great way to kind of unfold that particular layer to the universe. Yeah. I, um, I'll just throw something quick in here. My, one of my favorite parts is, I mean, I I just love this story. It's great. You know, it's a detective story. There's some great action in it. And again, with the world building and fleshing that out, but I, I really enjoyed the part where she goes to see CEO Gladstone who, you know, is an old friend of her dad's. So she sort of has that access to her. And what I really dug was how she uh, brought her personal farcaster into existence. And they went to a planet that has no data sphere so they could talk privately, you know, and she kind of gets all this super interesting dirt about what's going on, you know, and we learn more about the Technocore and Hyperion and just kind of the bigger picture with the ousters and all of that stuff. It's kind of the major intro of all the politics. Yeah, and and how, you know, like what what the the real deal is with the Technocore. Like we we haven't really gotten any of that up until that part, you know, and now they're kind of <clears throat> hinting that the Technocore may not be on the up and up and, you know, have humanity's best interests in mind and so forth and so on. So I really like that part. What'd you think of this one, Ben? That's great, man. It's, uh, you know, it's part noir detective story, but it also has like a really strong cyberpunk element to it, which is, you know, definitely something I'm way into. Uh, I've always been a huge fan of like William Gibson and, uh, you know, all the early, uh, cyberpunk writers and it's kind of interesting i never really thought about the fact that when this book came out was kind of like when all of that was getting started so um you know i wonder uh if it's just sort of coincidental that you know he happened to be writing this and you know by the time it came out like there was already a bunch of other stuff sort of tackling that that uh that genre Mm. or if he was influenced by something else you know but um it also uh this particular story like you know really uh will just go ahead and use this one again, opens the kimono to a lot of, uh, (laughs) to to a lot of, uh, the, you know, what's going on in the world at large and, you know, just things that we really had no idea about before. So, and it does it really well. It like covers a lot of ground, (laughs) um, but without being so dense that it's like unentertaining, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What do you mean? What do you mean when you say covers a lot of ground? Like by 
like what exactly? Well, you know, like just like what you were talking about, uh, you know, the going in and and finding out about the different factions of the Technocore. Oh, instance, okay, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, is one thing that's like really huge. And then and then you know, uh, meeting with Gladstone and finding out about like you know, just kind of like getting like the really what's going on. Well, they go to this planet where they there's no data sphere because the Technocore would be able to see and hear everything they said otherwise so it's it, it adds like a new layer of tension in a way mm, very much so anyways you as the reader find out about this shit so gotcha yeah i i, I didn't know if you just meant like the world building or whatever like it, it's super cool kind of getting the the vision of what lusus is is really like and again annoying you know discrepancy from the audiobook like i always thought it was lucis me too but it's lusus <laughs> yeah whatever it's, like, it's okay. still lucis <laughs> whatever <laughs> But it just the whole idea of of the hives, man, and like all of that was just like I, you just picture such a massive industrial world, almost like Corazon, you know what I mean? Mm. But like dirtier and and much grosser, you know, like a you know the things just everything's open twenty five eight, you know, it's it's just kind of crazy like that. But I like how he included how the people literally physically evolved and adapted to the planet itself with the one six G. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so non-critical to the story, but I love that it's still explained enough to make it interesting. Absolutely, man. Or just like all the cool little techniques she used to like trail him and, you know, trail the various people. Like she's like, I took a melanin tablet and I looked like a, you know, a black woman in her forties and like, you know, super, super neat. A lot, a lot of cool things there, man. When it segues well into the, uh, the chase sequence, which was quite an awesome action piece where, you know, she ends up chasing after someone. She, she hunts down one of the potential perpetrators of, Johnny's murder and ends up chasing him through a bunch of farcaster portals onto a whole bunch of different planets and it's a it's a really wild ride culminating in like a ice blizzard planet frostbite weird <laughs> fist fight that turns into the guy exploding <laughs> into like blue flames and stuff and it was just a well that actually happens that that part he ex- he dies on Maui Covenant but right before that they're on Soldier Coney Septum which is yeah the snow an- planet another yeah, it's a snow planet with another high G world, you know, but it's been sort of parts of it have been terraformed or whatever. So there's like that. I think it's the it's not the River Tethys, obviously, but it's it's like part of the world walk, you know, pretty cool concept in in and of itself. Yeah, it's like a tourist stroll through a bunch of different worlds that these people are like running, running through, blasting each other like James Bond chase sequence. Yeah. The the story kind of culminates in an interesting way where you know the the chase scene comes to an end it doesn't really matter the details of it and she ends up meeting Johnny at a farcaster and they farcast to earth and that is a, the first time that earth is actually mm. around and it very much has a hitchhiker's guide kind of earth 2 kind of vibe going on which I didn't put two and two together until recently but well yeah, we don't know at this point in the story if it's Earth or not. Well, no, it says it's Earth, but it's, they just don't know if it's old Earth or not. It's it's a reconstruct. It, they think it's a reconstruction of Earth. Yeah, and so they end up hooking up on Earth, which is you know a bit of a traditional detective-y noir trope, and um, and place to hook up. And it's a good place to hook up. And <laughs> and then they end up uh needing to get out of Dodge and go back into the the main web and in order to avoid getting, you know, busted by the authorities, end up at the Shrike uh Shrike Church, which is an interesting kind of um final scene for that story. Very much so. I just thought I I think like, you know, she ends up at the Shrike Temple and the Shrike all of the various, you know, priests of the Shrike cult are treating her very differently and and saying that she's important and stuff and it's just a it's an interesting shift in tone and and you're kind of like oh what's going on here there's something bigger going on yeah well especially like from the events of the story you know with like the guy that's chasing her Q being his bodyguard and all of that stuff you know and then it turns out that she's the sort of 
mother of the atonement. Like, you know, it's just crazy, man. But you don't know what it is, yeah. Right, and you don't know, and the Shrike Church is just super weird, and, like, I, I love the entire sequence from when she wakes up in the bottom of Dreg's Hive and he bought all of the armor and the weapons, just that whole bit from them to the front door of the church was just fantastic. Yeah. And I suppose one of the elements that we, we glossed over was, you know, when Johnny is, is quote unquote killed early on by having a certain amount of time deleted from him, he doesn't know what he was doing. And it turns out that he was meeting with a Templar to potentially join this pilgrimage. And so that's kind of where it all comes full circle in the church. Mm Mm-hmm. I had actually forgotten about that until I listened to it. And I listened to that story last night and I was like, oh, right. You know, and then it was even posited whether it was Mastine that he had spoken to and he, you know, she wasn't sure, but you know, that was a kind of a interesting little nugget right there. Yeah. So it culminates with a, a gun battle on the steps where Johnny's killed and then he's put in that Shrone loop into Johnny Mnemonic into the side of her head. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's it. We get back to the pilgrimage, and then we move on to the console story, basically. Yeah, last one. So they arrive at Kronos Keep, and then the console tells his tale. That's right. The one the one interlude part that was kind of exciting there was uh, Kassad having to rig the, the tram car brake and then oh, yeah. run and jump onto the tram car. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, that was cool. And that uh, I also like that Father Hoyt has a balalaka, because that always makes me think of... <laughs> Wind of change. <laughs> oh, see, I always I thought you were going to say it makes you think of your nine string balisette. <laughs> <laughs> now it will make me think of that. My nine string balisette. That was my worst Picard impression. Now it always makes me think of. Uh, Let your balalaka sing for you and me. <laughs> what the fuck is that? It's uh, my, Scorpions, my man. terrible Klaus Mine impression from the Scorpions. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Okay. Uh, I'm not accepting a death for that. That was definitely you dying. Oh, that is a death or not? I think it might be, man. It might be. Mm. I thought it was kind of funny. I, I, I was, I was going to contribute, but you kept talking. So, yeah, uh, Chad. Yeah, no, I, I. That's not. We're not going to rule that. This is going to be the deathless episode. If you, okay. if you want to get your Klaus mind right, you got to pronounce your your uh, a sounds like e. Well, let's hear it. You know, so like you'd be like winds of change instead of saying change. It sounds like you say winds of change. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> man, that is some deep nerve yeah. right there. I love it. Yeah. The console's tale. So this one's an interesting one because the the book opens with the console not wanting to join the pilgrimage and being grumpy. And then he kind of (laughs) delays wanting to tell his story through the whole book. And then he finally ends up having to do it. So it's an interesting kind of, uh, I don't know. I don't know if tension is the right word, but it's just interesting that he's he's hesitant the whole way through. It's also interesting that he sort of starts the entire book. The it opens on him, so it's sort of like he's kind of the thread weaver in this, but at the same time, he's kind of mysterious and absent through a lot of it as well. Mm. You know, I don't know. That was always the the feel I got from the console, and he's also one of my favorite characters. Yeah, and he's got a cool ship, one of the coolest ships ever, ever. <laughs> Ever. Do we want to do a recap or do we want to do this one a little different considering? Well, the recap is pretty simple. He, as they bring this world of Maui Covenant into the web or they're preparing to, it's basically an ecological paradise. And a lot, all of the, the sort of the eco freaks ended up moving there. And he, as a force officer, fell in love with a woman on the planet. And because of time dilation, he has eight visits with her, and each time she is so much older, and he's only a few weeks older. And they end up pulling Maui Covenant into the web at the end of the tale, and then basically the tourists come in and just destroy the planet and the ecology. And he vows revenge, sort of, and that's sort of the, his whole motivation. It turns out that it's not him, it's his grandfather, right? Right. Yeah, it's his grandfather. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really interesting one. I suppose it's like... It's well-placed as the last story because it's 
kind of significantly different than the other ones, you know, especially now that we're looking back at it as, as to how they flow together. And it's it's a really interesting one in the sense that it's really like rev- quite revolutionary in terms of like actual revolution against the hegemony. So it's well placed and it, it really, I think, sets sets it up for, you know, what is the hegemony going to do and are the ousters going to actually come in and fuck shit up? And, and, and it's it's an interesting story. It very. I, I think that... You know, this story, it's kind of got three tones kind of wrapped up into one. It's like the double agent spy thriller mixed with like, you know, the kind of insurgent kind of thing, but also with like the the long play revenge story as well. You know, like yeah. this guy is pissed. Yeah, like he's beyond pissed, man. Like, oh my God. The yeah. fact that he's willing to destroy all of humanity just to kind of get back at the hegemony for for a slight is it's pretty psychotic and not and not only that but he doesn't give a shit if he dies in the process yeah it's very suicidal revenge yeah as long as there's a giant middle finger up at the hegemony when it is all done he's cool with that yeah it's pretty nihilistic man very much a lebowski nihilist <laughs> i believe in nothing <laughs> Yeah, it's quite the reveal, right? Because, like you said, they don't, you know, the the console is kind of like a main part of the story throughout, but we don't know anything about him really. And uh, I sure as hell wasn't expecting any of that. No, on my first read through. So yeah, it was it, it was uh, it was you know, with with all the reveals that happen in the book, which are are great and surprising. This one was probably the the took the cake, you know. Yeah, well, if I remember correctly, it's the prologue where Mana Gladstone speaks to the consul and says that there's like a spy in the pilgrimage, right? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so like the whole book you're trying to figure out who the spy is and and it kind of leads you down the path of Het Mastine because he disappears. You you, kind of you're kind of given a a bit of a Mm. wild goose chase there and then it turns out in the last story, the consul's like, no, no, it was me and I want all of you to fucking die. And you're like, whoa, all right. The red herring. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. But the um, in terms of the story itself, I um, I really really enjoyed the time debt relationship between Marin and Siri, where you know this young punk sailor kid breaks away from the uh, you know the oil rig or whatever and flies over to a party and hooks up with a young teenage girl, you know, and and the whole time you kind of think it's just like a young love thing, and then he goes back and you know she's ten years older and. It gets weird in the in the aging sense, but you kind of come to find towards the end that like she picks him up, you know, from the beginning as a a vehicle to to the revolution, you know. So she's not using him per se, but like she's not dumb. She's not a dumb seventeen year old who falls in love with an off worlder. She's like a very very smart and savvy person mm-hmm. who uh, who falls in love, but also uh, recognizes the strength of. Uh, you know, radicalizing an off-worlder and stuff. It's a really fascinating tale. Yeah, it is a fascinating tale. I definitely, I've, you know, obviously read this numerous times, listened to it a couple of times. So this round, I skipped this part, that part of the story, like the, just the the meetings and all of that stuff. And I, I really just, I listened to the last, well, I don't know how many pages it is, but the last 40 minutes of the audio book I listened to two or three times yesterday. Um, because that was the part I really wanted to, you know, sort of know about was when he finishes the tale and then he, then he really kind of gives a lot more backstory about himself and his motivations and all of that, which I just found incredibly interesting, especially, you know, the whole story about the diplomatic corps and meeting the ousters and the ship and all of that. It was just awesome. All the double agent stuff. Yeah, absolutely, man. Not just that, but like you really hear how pissed he is. That's the part when he really starts talking about how epically pissed he is, you know? Yeah. Is it? I I know he's trying to destroy the hegemony, but maybe not that he's uh, so much allied with the ousters, but um, it doesn't seem like he has it in for that portion of humanity. Mm -mm. No. No. He respects them because he says they've managed to do in – you know, like more in 500 years than we ever dreamed we could do. Or, you know, they actually did the things, you know, that we talk about doing, like in terms of like 
really evolving and learning to adapt to the environment. Yeah. And not only that, but they did it without colonizing planets. So it would make him it would make him hate the hegemony even more. Right. So just just to be clear, it's not that he wants to destroy all of humanity. It's really the power structure of the hegemony that he's after. So he's not like he's not genocidal per se. He just, you know, yeah. Well, no, but he does talk about how, like, I mean, he's essentially, this is like the ecologist story, you know, the the tree hugger story, you know, where it's like the ecology of the planet got destroyed. And then when he was in the diplomatic corps, his job basically was to go to a lot of these new worlds and on the worlds where they found creatures that were marginally intelligent in terms of life forms you know, he basically just said they made up a reason to say that they weren't intelligent enough and they just killed him off. And and that that too was the other part of why he was so pissed was that things are not allowed to just let lie and evolve the way that they naturally would. It's like we come in humans with force and just like destroy everything and harvest the life forms and like destroy the ecology of the planet. You know, he talks about the centaurs of garden and you know, the little flat disc things on the Hebron world. Like, you know, so he's, he's really the advocate for the environment basically, you know, and, and he said, and he says the ousters are the next, next target on the list. And, uh, in a way, Benny, your veggie burger interlude fits. Cause it's all about fighting against the suffering of, uh, sentient species. <laughs> there you have it. There it is. This whole book is an advertisement. For the Duncan Gola veggie burger. <laughs> Duncan Gola, it's worth the trip. <laughs> oh, time to make the Golas. <laughs> totally, man. Anyway, um, other thoughts on this story. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull us back to the time debt relationship because you kind of glossed over it and changed the topic. I I think that for me, certainly on the rereading, maybe not on the first read, but the idea of the time debt relationship and the like, how mind blowing it would be to be like a 20 year old young man traveling between the stars and and you know hooking up with this tragically beautiful young woman and knowing that the next time you see her she's going to be like eight years older than you hanging out for a week and then dipping out again and coming back and now she's you know whatever mid-30s or whatever and then all of a sudden he comes back and she's like 60 something like that was a really totally it was a wild story and it was a bit of a mind fuck you know like you put yourself in that young man's shoes and it's just like that's just bizarre but amazing and weird and and then it culminates with like him coming back she's dead she was like a major political figure and he meets his sons who are older than him and it's just like the it's just the weirdest and coolest bit of sci-fi yes and i would just add that i i think the best exploration of time dilation was in interstellar sure it was so good like because when they would leave in the shuttle to explore those planets you know the guy that stayed in the ship was like aging so much faster like that was just wild to me so ditto with this story you know it's 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 just like you said it's just mind-bending to think about it wrap your head around it Mm, super creative because his yeah his son was essentially like you know four years younger than him in the final meeting, the eighth meeting, Siri was dead. So it was, you know, this big to do at Siri's tomb, you know, and he wasn't much older than his oldest son. Just crazy. Yeah. And then I think all that twisty, double crossy stuff and the revolution kicks off. But I just remember that being really awesome. Anything on the time debt relationship, Benny, or not really? No. It, it honestly, like, didn't really leave any kind of impression on me. I was like, yes, yeah, so that would happen. <laughs> that, that's really all. Yeah, right. Um, that's that's how it works. I, I definitely that that concept blew my mind when like I don't know I was watching like Cosmos as a kid or something and realizing that like you know if you left the planet and you were you know traveling at light speed or whatever when you came back things would be very different depending on how long you were you know the, the time would pass differently on Earth than it would. So that concept definitely blew my mind then, but now it just seems like a thing that would happen if you you know <laughs> yeah. If you were doing that between Cosmos and Charlton Heston and the Statue of Liberty, you've seen it. You've seen it before. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's an interesting way to use the story. Yeah, 
um, or it's an interesting way to use the concept, I guess. Um, but it didn't really strike me as being something like, you know, it didn't like mystify me. Yeah. Maybe it didn't mystify me either. I just really enjoyed it as a uh, storytelling mechanism. Mm. Yeah, I can dig that. It worked well. It works well in the story, man, for sure. Well, that's us. What? How does it wrap up? It wraps up with the Wizard of Ozzy thing, huh? Well, the basically that the the battle for Hyperion is starting overhead in this sort of last part of this, the last story, and it continues. And you know, they continue on to the time tombs, and they you know, they walk in step and they sing the Wizard of Oz, which is which is the craziest conclusion ever. I remember reading that and just being like, huh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a little bit of like, uh, not descent, but like the rest of the pilgrims kind of don't really know what to do with the consul after he tells his story. Um, and there's there's a little bit of like, you know, what should we do? And but they decide that should we kill him? They should stick together. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's sort of funny in a weird way how they kind of ask him like these sort of dumb, straightforward questions. Like after he finishes the story, he's like, you know, did you do this? Did you kill Hetmastine? Are you going to kill us all? And he's like, no. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. why would he reveal that even if it were true? You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. I suppose I suppose it fits in the sense that, like, if this and the second book are considered one book, it's just kind of a throwaway thing, like, where they just talk to the constant, like, ah, eh, whatever, you're fine, and then on to the next major part of the story. But there probably was a year or two in between the publishing, and so you'd just be like, wait, what? And then, you know, Saul Weintraub sings, we're off to see the wizard. And you just be like, no, 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 no. I mm. want to know what the hell's going on here. And that will have to wait for the next book. That's it. Um, closing, closing thoughts? This story is so good. This is the beginning of one of the best sci-fi series probably ever. It's that good. And it still holds up today. That's all I'm going to say. Yo, I rhymed. Yeah, I mean, this book tees up all the best shit <laughs> that is yet to come in the story. So it's a great introduction. And, uh, you know, the story at large is definitely some of my favorite sci-fi out there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll echo what you guys said. Um, if you've made it this far on the podcast and you haven't read it, read the rest of them, man. Don't let us spoil them. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> uh, I'm assuming that if you're still listening to this, you've read the first book. And if you've only read the first book, buckle up. Cause it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And um, certainly, I definitely agree that this is one of my favorite universes in sci-fi, along with, you know, the dunes and the revelation spaces. And, mm -hmm. you know, I suppose it's uh, not too late to say these two words and impale myself on the Star Wars death. Don't do it, man. <laughs> this is this was supposed to be the deathless episode. Don't do it. Yeah, we're not supposed to. The Shrike is supposed to kill us, not not ourselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I would very highly recommend uh, reading or rereading if you uh, if you've only read this one or if you haven't read any of them, just read the hell out of them. They're so good. Yeah. Or if you don't read a lot or you don't have the time, check out the Audible audiobook. I have all of the books on audiobook, and since I don't have as much time to read, it's great to just throw these in in lieu of a podcast or whatever and listen to them. Super entertaining. The narration is decent. Good call. Uh, the voice work is pretty good. Some of it gets a little. Uh, well, let me just use my lowest voice for this character. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> but for the most part, it's pretty solid. They use um, a couple of different actors in the first story in particular. Yeah, I love that there is such a thing now as the Audible style audiobook if you just can't be bothered with digging into an actual bookie book. And the fact that you can get it for free with a trial or whatever is pretty awesome too if you've never signed up for it before. I got to say that um, in the audiobook version, Moneta sounds like a combination between Isabella Rossellini and I can't remember her first name, but Bruce Bruce Willis, Bruno, had numerous nicknames for her in Pulp Fiction, you know, his little French girlfriend. Oh, yes. Lemon pie, <laughs> pumpkin pie. <laughs> She kind of sounds Slice like that. Blueberry pie. Exactly. That's how <laughs> Moneta five, sounds. Five sausages. Do you like my pot? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what do you want to smoke pot? What? <laughs> no, my pot. My pot belly. <laughs> no, a pot belly. 
I love. There's a cul de sac uh, for you. There is a cul de sac. Yeah, there you go. I was I was kind of waiting for Moneta to go. Anytime is a good time for pie. <laughs> oh boy! But that that's how she talks in the story, like this. My name is Moneta or Memosin, whichever you prefer. So anyway, that's enough about the uh, voice acting <laughs> in the audio books. Yes, yes, yes. Speaking of acting and and uh, the Hyperion series, that might be some of the only acting you get to see because this movie has been in adaptation hell for many, many, many moons. Dude, Ben just swooped in and stole my nugget. That was the only nugget I had. Well, I had another one. Oh, sorry, bud. That's all right. No, don't be silly. No, that's it. You can finish the thought. I mean, you're going to talk about Brad Cooper or... Yeah, Brad Cooper was, he's trying to develop this, but, you know, honestly, man, this story is so damn good. If it doesn't get done in series form, it's dead before it starts. And, you know, it's just, it's just got to be done right. Well, either way, I mean, I think there's a lot of potential there, but if they're going to do an adaptation uh, for, you know, film or TV, they really got to make sure they do it. They got to take their time and make sure they do it right. Because it's a huge undertaking and, you know, there's a small but dedicated fan base that will moan incessantly if you don't get it right so get it right <laughs> i agree i would be one of those moaners yeah. man for sure this is a staple of my uh nerd life is this book series and we had no deaths i'm so glad that we didn't try and do both books even though i think it would have been good to do <laughs> that, was, that was challenging as man books are tough this is really tough yeah. yeah yeah well i mean we're cutting our teeth so that's you know but it's bound to be uh, all over the place on the first try. Yeah, true that. All right, so we want to just say, uh, folks, thanks so much for joining us on our first foray into talking about a science fiction book. Thanks again so much for joining us, folks, and we will see you next time. See ya. Yeah, thanks. See ya. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. It means the world to us. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a variety of wonderful ways. You can rate us and review us on Stitcher, iTunes, Pocket Cast, Podcast Republic, wherever you get your podcast muffins. You can also tell somebody to check out the show. Word of mouth is incredibly powerful and incredibly effective, turns out. You can find the show notes for this episode in your podcast app of oh, choice or at our website, ebd.fm forward slash episodes forward slash... 69. You can find me at Mulverine on Twitter. You can find Ben and Jarhigo on Twitter. And you can find Chad at Chad Normal on Twitter. You can ask us questions via email, uh, contact at ebd.fm. Also, using our Twitter hashtag, AskEBD. You can follow us on most socials with the handle EBD Podcast. Folks, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on another time. <laughs>